you're immediately speaking to something that a lot of people in your country care about. So I think you've, you've got a panorama of opportunities, and then there are the intangibles that Jorge brought up. It may be that the ministry, minister of the environment is a bird watcher, <laughs> right? Or it may be that um, the president rides in an elevator with somebody who does something. And so some of those things are completely random and unpredictable. But sometimes you have to jump on those. Okay, so here's Kristalka who's jumped so Im impolitely in front of Fatima. Thank you, Fatima, for your polite patience. <laughs> uh, I think Town gave a partial answer. Uh, my answer, and you used the word leapfrog, and that's and that the answer is in that. Um, in the history of technology, um, and in the history of institutions. Some countries have had to build it, build it, build it with whatever technology was available then. And ironically, but wonderfully, the developing countries could then, on the basis of the technology that was developed, leapfrog directly to that technology without having to reinvent it. It was there for implementation. So you don't have to go through the early stages of the internet and all that. You now have wireless like that. So when you, look, when you think of the Biodiversity Institution or CREA or Canabio, these were all started from scratch many years ago without any partners. And each one had to reinvent or invent its own tools, its own way of doing things. There were no partnerships really. But 20, 30, 50 years hence, you don't have to do that in Kenya. You can instantly become a biodiversity informatics institution through partnerships that were not available to, um, to us, to CREA, to Canabio, and other institutions. Um, you can avail yourself of instantly of all the data of the globe on biodiversity through GBIF. You can avail yourself of all the standards for informatics. You can avail yourself of all the tools that CREA and Canabio and, and we have come up with, as, as well as many others. And you can avail yourself of the expertise. So it's through that partnerships, and that's what I'm going to talk, be talking about tomorrow, um, your institution and every institution that is now a startup, through the right partnerships, can now become a high capacity informatics institution. It's a virtual institution in part because a lot of the work can be imported from elsewhere and shared and, and partnered uh, with other institutions around the world. But to your minister, to the people you report to, it doesn't matter. To them it's transparent. So if you want to do this malaria study, you will work with Peterson and my condolences um, and, 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 and other researchers. But it doesn't matter who you're partnering with, it's the results that count. So it's really a community now that was not present 20, 30 years ago. So leapfrogging now is absolutely possible. Thank you, Chris. So I think Chris spoke a lot about leapfrogging and partnerships and, and those types of things. What I wanted to mention was to bring us back a bit to the research questions or to the questions that that, that should be asked. Lucy, um, I think that also is very much dependent on national needs and priorities. What we've done, I think I've mentioned to you briefly, within South Africa we've had an initial period also where very much we've built a strong partnership with GBIF. Following that also we've become involved in the EOL initiative. We've also nationally been involved in the South African Biosystematics Initiative which has been a conduit of funding for the systematists I think for the last 10 years or so. And government has now basically said to us that these initiatives are not all speaking to one another. So they basically want us to 
find a model, find a mechanism to ensure that the data that's being generated, that's being disseminated, that the information that's being generated is, is actually also being disseminated and that this gets used in policy. So what's now been developed is what's called the Foundational Biodiversity Integrated Programs. And through this, what, it, what is intended to happen is that resources also gets used more efficiently, but that basically that we filter the information through through our systems and that it responds to policy. What's important here also is that the way that we engaged with the decision makers was also we had a process there. We engaged with government stakeholders to find out from them what are the, your really important issues that you need to have resolved and dealt with through the kind of mechanisms that we do have available. So we explained basically biodiversity informatics, we explained what we are doing within SANBI and the, the type of information that we have and how can this be relevant for them. So it was a process of engaging with government officials. It's a process then following that of engaging with the scientists and how they can contribute to this program, communicating what we're doing and getting the message across. So through this process, the idea is that we understand what the policy issues are and also that this then aligns to government's mandate to the bioeconomy, to global change issues. And so ultimately what through this process also funding is available for stakeholders to come up with concepts that aligns itself for those two themes, that aligns itself to government's mandate as well. This will in turn enable people to collaborate, so scientists collaborating with museums, collaborating with policymakers. So ultimately the idea is that it's relevant nationally as well. Let's have a comment from Jean Malakani, and then we probably should wrap up because we have a dinner date in in a half hour. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. This is Jean uh, from DRC. It is just to say uh, something. <laughs> yeah, yes. There is the other Jean from Benin. <laughs> Yes, it is uh, about uh, our countries, especially the developing countries. Uh, so we have experiencing very bad situation. Like uh, in my country, uh, since several years, uh, seven, even 10 years, uh, one part of the country, the eastern part, is in the troubles in war. There, uh, the, the National Park of Virunga, which was uh, between the best uh, park, uh, I think, in, in Africa, is destroyed. It became virtual. <laughs> yes. How we can be working and setting really uh, good work uh, in building uh, informatic institutions in such conditions. It is difficult, very difficult. We will have to work only in a part of the country. The other, the other part, no way to follow, to do something because of that. Yeah. Besides this, we have also uh, authorities who, who are late to understand uh, the conservation, how to protect uh, the nature. Uh, here, I, I, read, I, I read in books that in South Africa, uh, people can be allowed to, to farm even uh, like rhinoceros, uh, hippopotamus, that uh, help to increase the number of those animals, which are, some are totally protected in, like in my country. They just don't, they can't allow people uh, to farm such kind of animals. So those make some difficult uh, to protect the nature. Yeah, uh, it is just. 
That's a very interesting commentary, Jean. Uh, I think maybe you've just identified a very interesting role for a biodiversity informatics institution in that ideally the DRC will have a picture of its biodiversity landscape that is not blanked out on the eastern third of the country because of conflicts. And so an effective institution for your country maybe looks to the older swath of biodiversity data and maybe looks to capture, synthesize, interpret that information so that there's not that you know, eastern third of the country completely without knowledge. So you can imagine that you know, if I, if I gave you a nice big endowment and set you up with a new building in Kinshasa and said, okay, set up your biodiversity informatics institution, maybe your first task would be to say, I'm going to start in the first half of the 20th century and I'm going to summarize that information very effectively and very completely. And that way at least I have the initial panorama across my whole country. And then you fill in the, the newer swath as feasible. And maybe for that, that eastern sector, maybe it takes a decade. But at least you have something. At least you're ready to do the planning or you can do the planning for when things improve. And it's just a thought. So I think we do have to wrap up for today. Um, you basically have 20 minutes to pick up your things and walk down the slope. I don't think it's raining outside. So walk down the slope. Huh? Okay. So there's some, if you want to ride down, Fatima can help. Um, but essentially you're just you're going, going to... We're going to eat quite a good meal. Would you like us to connect up to you by Skype so that you can hear us eat? What kind of meat? What kind of meal are you going to have? Apparently, it's quite good, and apparently, it's it's South African cuisine. So we're all looking forward to you, to it. Pan African, sorry. So, Jorge, thank you very much for 56 minutes and 13 seconds of your time. <laughs> and it was a pleasure to be there, at, even if only virtually. And I, I think we won't see you again, or hear you again. So thanks more generally for all the time put together, put into making the movies and talking with us first thing in the morning. <laughs> yes, it was a pleasure, guys. I hope you will uh, profit from this, uh, from this experience. And you know, I have to say, I really like talking with you when you're in a movie because I can either put you on pause, or mute, or fast forward. <laughs> I hope my, the, those little movies were not a total disaster. The first time I do something like that, um, I was sort of uneasy about it. 